All right, well, let's go. Welcome, everyone. Welcome to EPIP Sankofa Summer. This is not our first session, but our opening plenary. Um, I wanted to give a few um, quick tech reminders for everyone. Um, you will be uh, invited to talk freely during this session, to ask questions, to have them answered, to give comments. But while others are speaking, we would ask that you mute. Um, and so if you see the microphone button there, you can unmute and, un and mute yourself there. We welcome everybody to be on video and say um, hello in the chat. Um, you feel free to rename yourself and add your pronouns there as well. Um, if you need to leave the meeting, there is a waiting room and I will let you back in. Um, just let me know. I know folks have tech issues from time to time, so you are welcome to leave and come back in as you need to. Um, so sufficiently welcomed, I would love to hand it over now to our Executive Director, Storm Gray, to talk a little bit about EPIP and get us started. Great, thank you, Tamitha. Hi, everyone, and good afternoon or morning, depending on where you're, you're joining us from today, and welcome to the opening plenary for Sankofa Summer. Um, I wish that I could see all of you in person. Uh, as many of you know, we had planned to host our 2020 National Conference in San Diego, but we're still here and able to have community and be in community with one another over the next six weeks through our Sankofa Summer programming. Uh, we thought that today's conversation was the best one to have, particularly at this moment in time. Um, Sankofa is a West African idea that invites us to take the lessons learned from our past, to contextualize and understand our present as we look forward to reimagining our future. And I would say that that's um, pretty apropos for where we are at this point in time as a nation, and specifically where EPIP is as we approach almost 20 years in 2021. So for those of you who don't know a little bit about EPIP, I wanted to just share with you who we are. Uh, Emerging Practitioners in Philanthropy, or EPIP for short, is a national network of change makers, early and mid-career professionals in philanthropy who strive for excellence and equity in the practice of philanthropy. And our mission, if you will, to the next slide, uh, is to empower emerging leaders and elevate philanthropic practice in order to build a more just, equitable, and sustainable world. Little known fact is that women of color have played a tremendous role in EPIP's history over the past almost 20 years. In today's conversation, you'll have the opportunity to hear from some of them. And they are but a small sampling of the women who have helped to shape this organization, but it is an important conversation for us to have, and I could not be more happy to share this virtual space and stage um, with some of my sisters in this work. Uh, so with that, I will turn it over to our moderator for today and good friend, Melissa Hewitt, who is the founder and principal of Forward Movement Consulting. Melissa? You're muted. <laughs> Thank you, Tamitha and Storm, for that great welcome um, uh, and for all the great work that you do. Um, Shepherding along EPIP, welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Melissa Hewitt and I am uh, sitting in my office in Silver Spring, Maryland um, and happy to see faces today and I'm really excited about this conversation. Um, I want to invite uh, my friends, my colleagues to uh, introduce themselves briefly, um, and then we want to jump into a conversation. And uh, the way that we want to have the conversation is really organically and as a conversation. So please share questions, raise hands in the chat group. We'll be monitoring and um, we're so excited that you all chose to join us today. So um, I want to invite uh, Michelle to um, introduce herself, um, uh, Jasmine, and then uh, Lynetta as well. Good morning, everyone from uh, California, San Diego, California. Michelle Hadamijo, Director of uh, Education Initiatives at the San Diego Foundation. I'm also a, a proud uh, uh, a member of the National Advisory Committee 
our board of emerging practitioners and philanthropy. Uh, I'm so happy to be here with all of you and this incredibly esteemed panel of friends and colleagues. Good afternoon, everyone. I am Jasmine Paul Ratliff with uh, Keisha Harris and Associates, and I play the role of deputy director there. I'm based in St. Louis, and I was a uh, board chair of EPIP in the past. Good afternoon. I'm Lynetta Gilbert. Um, I'm the managing partner for my own firm, Gilbert and Associates, and I'm in New Orleans today. And I'm excited to be with you. Awesome. Thank you, ladies. All right. Well, we're going to jump right in. And in true EPIP fashion, we want to start with stories. So um, we've asked um, everyone to think about uh, an EPIP story that they want to share um, that really connects sort of the different roles that we've played um, and um, in our journey with EPIP because of all of us it's been sort of a journey. Um, so I would invite my colleagues to share what is your favorite EPIP story that you want to share? I'll start. Um, so my favorite EPIP story is that there wasn't an EPIP of when I first started talking with Rusty. Um, and Rusty Stahl had a vision of ways that philanthropy could really um, encourage and promote young people in the field. And he was a program officer at, I mean, a program associate at Ford when I was a program officer. And the more he talked about the idea, the more it resonated with me because I really wanted to see some of the critical work being done at that time grow and be sustained by newer, younger people in the field. So um, I met Rusty Stahl with an idea and I was, I think a good grant maker because I heard it, it sounded right and I put some money into it. So, um, and the other part of the story was 10 years later when I went to the EPIP conference I didn't know that the shift had occurred in terms of the opening receptions or whatever. So when I walked into this room and it was a party, I didn't know what to do. <laughs> I was so, uh, and it was clearly, I was the only one who didn't realize that it was going to be a real party. So that was, that's my EPIP story. Thank you, Lynetta. And for those of you who, who um, don't know, Lynetta, as she was at Ford Foundation, as she said, invested in EPIP was, we call, um, we call her the angel investor. She was the first real investor in EPIP as an idea. And we all know how important that is when you have an idea and are looking for that first bit of seed money to really solidify and affirm your vision. And she was that um, for EPIP. What other stories do we want to share today, ladies? I can go next. Um, so I first met Rusty in 2008, 2009, when I had moved to New Jersey to join the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation and um, had come to know of him through Trista Harris, who was also a former board chair and was actively involved in the Minnesota or Minneapolis EPIP chapter at the time. And uh, she and I had met through ATSI. And so I met Rusty learned more about EPIP, thought it was great because I was finding myself uh, by myself in many foundation circles being the only young person in the room. Um, at the time, EPIP was very focused on engaging young people in, in philanthropy and bringing them into the fold and building up their leadership. So I joined the New York City Steering Committee and then after having my daughter, found that I couldn't tra transport myself up to New York as, as often as I would like. but. Um, Rusty continued to engage me uh, at RWJF, and that actually ultimately resulted in RWJF giving EPIP a significant grant for operating support um, through champions that I and a colleague at RWJF cultivated at the foundation. So it was fantastic to get more involved at the chapter level and then get involved at the national level when Rusty asked me to join the board. And I would say the EPIP parties are phenomenal too. <laughs> <laughs> I sore, I sorely miss them. <laughs> Wonderful. 
Uh, I'll jump in. Um, my my favorite, there are so many favorite EPUB stories, but my favorite EPUB story uh, to think about and to share is the origin story of EPIP San Diego. Um, I had uh, been introduced to EPIP when I was working in New York uh, for the San Diego's Institute, which uh, did quite a lot of work around uh, community foundations and community philanthropy globally. Um, and my colleague, Angela Pandey, who's now at Philanthropy Northwest, uh, uh, facilitated uh, an EPIP event at our headquarters. And that's when I was introduced to EPIP and introduced to, you know, the very different and bolder and more visionary conversation around philanthropy and its uh, role and imperative um, that was being had in that space of uh, really young, vibrant, excited people <laughs> about, the, you know, folks that were really excited and, and leaning into their, to their work. And um, I got to know EPIP a little bit and then had the opportunity to move to San Diego to focus specifically on a binational network of community foundations here. And I was just in some sort of philanthropy space early on uh, living here uh, some meeting some somewhere and made reference to social justice philanthropy um, and someone who came to be uh, the chapter one of the chapter's best champions uh, you know with lots of great intention said to me you you probably shouldn't say that that's that's probably too much too much New York for this space and um so myself and three amazing women decided that we would, you know, invite people to our living room if we couldn't, if we couldn't talk about the ideas uh, that we had for philanthropy in the meeting room. Uh, you know, somebody would bring the wine, somebody brings the cheese, somebody brings the tacos because it's San Diego. Uh, and we would create the space for having the conversation that we wanted to have about our work, about our sector, about the future of our sector. Um, and, and lead from there. And so that uh, is, is, is where I started and where I remain uh, with EPIP. Awesome. Thank you, Michelle. Okay. Uh, so my favorite EPIP story is actually my first EPIP story. Uh, I joined EPIP uh, at the advice of a former supervisor of mine uh, work, when I worked at the Council on Foundations. And she said, it was really important to find your network, to find your people, to find your tribe. So I'm like, okay. She gave me a, a list and one of the list of organizations was EPIP. And I attended my first EPIP conference in 2015 in New Orleans and not only fell in love with the city of New Orleans, but fell in love with this idea of EPIP at the same time. Because here on the plenary stage were these, you know, giants in my mind of philanthropy who were talking very boldly and forthrightly about social justice and philanthropy's role in making right some of the historic wrongs of this country. And I'm like, what? You can say that in public on a stage and people will cheer you for it? Oh no, this is where I need to be. These are my people, this is my tribe. And a lot of the folks that I met at that time have become my friends, close confidants, allies, champions, and shoulders to cry on to this day. Um, and so I have been immensely grateful for EPIP in providing me a space because before then I'd been in the sector for about eight years and felt very much alone. And it wasn't until I stepped into the EPIP community that I realized that I wasn't alone, that I wasn't crazy for these ideas, that I wasn't insane for wanting the sector to be better, to show up better, to prioritize people and communities of color. Um, and so that's my favorite EPIP story. Awesome, awesome. So Storm, I wanna, I was gonna say, I wanted to add to Storm's story. Um, I actually heard EPIP start talking about racial justice in 2012, 2013, and reacted the same way, because it was the first time I had heard uh, a non-identity base, but ABSI, of course, had been talking about it 
forever and hip and APIP and all of those groups, but one a group that was more mixed, um, talking about racial equity in really strong, powerful tones. Um, it was the Chicago conference and there was a panel on race and philanthropy, and I believe it was the president of the Chicago Trust, who was a white man at the time, was the one calling out all the other white people in the room saying, you need to speak up for racial equity and racial justice. You should not rely on the people of color in your organization to be the ones always talking about it. And there were folks who left the room while he was talking. Uh, I think there were folks who may have been a little offended by that, but I wanted to stand up and holler amen and wave my hand and all that uh, while he was doing that. Because it was I, was, I had the same reaction, like, you can say that? And you can say it in a room full of people? And it's a white man saying it? This is fantastic. <laughs> So I will I will jump on your reaction the same way. <laughs> That's awesome. That's awesome. I uh, gosh, I think I met Rusty in two thousand two. Um, so EPIP was fairly new. I was a grant maker in North Carolina, first time grant maker, first job in philanthropy, and um, uh. So it's very heartening to hear like, you know, that now there is a space to talk about racial justice, racial equity. In the beginning, talk more about social justice. Um, but I think my favorite EPIP story um, has to be when, um, I guess it was like the second conference that EPIP ever had. And um, I'd been to both the first one and the second one. And I think both of those conferences, there were particularly women of color who took me aside both times and said, talk to me about how difficult of a time they were having in philanthropy, whether it was ideology, whether it was um, being a new or a junior person in the organization and how to navigate um, the workplace um, and really just wanting to find a home or space where they could connect in. Um, so after that second conference, I, I was like, Rusty, I need to talk to you. And so we talked and I said, we need a space for like, just people of color, I think. Um, and to that day, I mean, it was 2005, 2006. I mean, we hadn't really had that before. I mean, we were e all together. Chapters were a new thing. We, you know, we were still in that kind of growth phase. And it was a radical notion to want to have a specific place for just grant makers of color within EPIP. And so we said, well, let's try to figure out some funding for it. Um, and we called it the, uh, uh, what are the people's color? Professional Professional yeah. Mm -hmm. And we said, look, we think there's a there there. Let's figure out if we can pull together some resources. Um, so we pulled together some resources. Two white men gave us money from two different foundations to support this work. And uh, it was not necessarily an easy sell, um, but it was a sell that Rusty really leveraged and put his neck out for because we were in a phase where we really wanted to you know, we were just trying to get more general operating support just to kind of be sustaining ourselves. Um, and he prioritized it um, because we felt like it was, you know, a priority for the organization. And so we had that first convening in Detroit and there were 50 people. Um, Kalpana Krishnamurthy, who at the time was the ED of Third Wave to help develop the curriculum and it was one of the most um, impactful experiences of my young professional life. It was just a space that we created for all the things that we thought we needed and things that we didn't know we needed. And we just designed the space and the weekend. I think that was my favorite EPIP story, both of like just re really trying to advocate for like what, not just what I need, but what others need. and pushing EPIP to have that conversation that we hadn't had to date um, in a real way. So well, Melissa, there's another lesson from that. Um, from that time and that story, one of the biggest word that comes out of that is courage. Mm. Um, because when I funded EPIP, my portfolio 
was named Community Philanthropy, Race and Equity in the American South. And my thesis was I was that there were these untapped um, leaders mm -hmm. in the South, young African American, who needed to be in the conversation as things would, were shifting in the South. They needed to be in the philanthropic conversation, the civic conversation, et cetera. I, I believed in the EPIP idea because we were not, I couldn't see many other ways that at least our foundation and maybe others were generating new and young leadership mm. into the field. So once EPIPs got going, I would talk to Rusty often about, so when are you gonna get some black people in there? And, you, and, I, if, and if I recall correctly, the way you met um, um, Rusty was, I had a convening in your town. In Greensboro. In Greensboro with other grantees and he met Melissa and they were talking and you know he could see, oh wow, I didn't know about a Melissa, that kind of thing. So I, I say this to say to you, you heard the story, understand that everything you do in philanthropy takes good research and courage. Mm -hmm. There's not a thing you will ever do that you know, people won't challenge you on. And if mm -hmm. they don't, then whatever you're doing probably isn't gonna last very long. Mm -hmm. so I just really want you to, to hear that from both all the stories so far, because um, each of these of my colleagues here had to step forward first step in their heart and say, oh, this is what I, I know I need. And then secondly, step forward and then look at them now. They're still doing great and marvelous work in the field. So that's the lesson mm -hmm. I would like to lift up from these this first conversation. Absolutely. Thank you for that, Lanetta. Well, I would, I wonder, um, curious to know, like how, tell me, tell us more, share more about um, how EPIP has contributed, like what's, what value has EPIP brought to you um, in your professional path? Um, we touched on, many of you touched on kind of the stories of um, how you found EPIP and like what it's, you know, it being a anchor, you know, immediate connection to like something that you need, but what over, the, over the years, what value has it bring? How has it contributed to your professional path? Storm? EPIP gave me space to breathe. Mm -hmm. I'd been in the sector, like again, for a couple years before even finding EPIP. And I'd always wondered what was wrong with me mm -hmm. where I was butting up against folks who said, no, that's too um, aggressive. No, that's too, like, you can't say race. No, I was getting all of these no's, right? And it was mm -hmm. making me second guess my place in philanthropy. So my background, I, I fell into philanthropy right out of college. Um, which I think is different for a lot of us who come to philanthropy later on in their career. Um, and I saw the potential in the sector, but I could not understand why a sector who, who says it, it's about the love of people didn't understand the harm that it was doing to some of the same communities that it sought to serve and was so afraid of having these conversations. And EPIP for me was a space where I could breathe and have my thoughts and feelings validated. And I actually had the space to, um, to try new ideas. Mm -hmm. I often say that oftentimes when people come to EPIP, they're running to EPIP from something else, from something they were not being able to receive either in their institution, from something they could not find in the networking spaces that they already had available. EPIP was a breath of fresh air for me. And what I appreciated about EPIP, and I, I appreciate about it even to this day, is the many opportunities that it afforded its members to lead. So I think about the conversation that you had and how the PDF, the Professional Development Fund, has become the People of Color Network and is still around to this day, right? Kalpana Krishnamurthy, like her, her legacy, your legacy is still around to this day. And, you know, the Emerging Leader Salon that Rusty and, and everyone thought about at our conferences is still around to this day. But all of that came about because members just had a question and the response was yes versus a no. Mm -hmm. It wasn't a no, but it was a yes. And let's push more. Let's innovate more. Let's create more. Let's dream bigger. Let's go higher. Let's go faster. And I think that for me is what EPIP has been able to do for me in my career because it has 
it is kind of validated an inner knowing and it has made me less afraid to be bold and to be courageous because I am with folks who understand and also are courageous in and of themselves. Absolutely. So I want to pick up on Storm's piece around leadership because that was what I jotted down in preparing uh, for this also. Um, joining the EPIT board was both a step out of my usual boundary and was also an opportunity to stretch in ways that I really never imagined I would be stretching before. Um, the EPIT board was my second board ever, and the first board I was on, again, I was the youngest at the table. I had, it was a board of a charter school, and I actually had the principal of that charter school say to my face, oh, no, I don't think I'm going to follow the, the advice that you just gave. Um, so to have, to be part of a board of folks who are sort of in my same space professionally and more or less the same age, um, provided me an opportunity to really build up the leadership skills, not just being on the board, but then becoming vice chair and then becoming chair. And it was all the uh, journey for me to find my leadership style, to find my voice, to learn how to speak up to learn how to manage people in, in one way or another. And the fact that during my tenure, we shifted to a new ED just gave me a whole other set of skills <laughs> that I probably would not have gained elsewhere, um, you know, to start a whole process of, of finding a new executive director. So when, when I would interview um, for positions throughout my career, I would always tap into my experience on the EPIP board um, and the, the things that I gained there, um, not only the expertise and experiences, but just even my own self-knowing and, and self-understanding um, on how to lead and how to be in a leadership space and how to feel comfortable around other leaders. Absolutely. Now, I, I, I would have to, I'd, I just wanna echo the sentiments around leadership particularly at the chapter level, it, I mean, leading a chapter really just provides you this incredible laboratory for building your leadership muscle. Um, and it allows you a safe space to fall flat on your face. <laughs> you know, and there's a, you're, you're falling flat on your face in a safe and caring environment. And then you get back up and you reach out to the chapter leaders and the chapter leader gatherings were always, um, so beneficial in that. So I think the leadership piece is um, uh, just a super priority. And, and, and for me personally, I, I also want to add that EPIP was a place where I, actually, where I also um, worked through some, some identity stuff. Um, I grew up in Canada. Uh, Canada has a different, and, and I'm not saying better on purpose because it's different, not better, but a different um, racial ethnic reality. Um, and so moving to the U.S. in my mid-20s, I just, I was, I was like worth learning this place and working through um, pieces of, of, of who I was as a Colombian Canadian in the US um, and what that meant for my career purpose and, and how I, I wanted to sort of connect all the pieces of me in service of the, of, of the, the work that I had a vision around. And EPIP was the place where I found the people to have that conversation with and to really lean on through, through some stuff that I was going through. So, uh, yeah, and all of the above. Yeah. So EPIP was for professionally for me. Um, if I had been a gambler, a gambler, I would have. I'd be well wealthy. EPIP and some other initiatives or, or groups that that we funded of young adults and young adult people of color were remarkable because nothing, you were undaunted. And um, 
Storm, when you said you worked at the Council on Foundations, I, I didn't know you then. But I was overwhelmed when um, Rusty said to me, oh, well, we got a space on the Council of Foundations conference. I said, you what? And you know, it was just, and then he said, yeah, and we're gonna have so-and-so and the names of people that he was having, even the president of, the then president of the Ford Foundation was gonna be in one of the salons. And I'm thinking, what is going on? But it, it said to me, you're right. These are, these are the next groups of philanthropic leaders. Give them what they need to be nurtured, to do a job differently and better. So even in our organized philanthropic circles, it was very difficult to get CEOs to really lean into this conversation on race, diversity, equity, and inclusion. And, and all of them, many of the foundations say, well, we're doing it. You know, we got you. We got an Indian. We got, you know what I'm saying? They would see it at that level. And, and even, even some of the work that had been funded by some of the foundations, like community knows what community knows and you should be engaging them. That was done, you know, by um, John McKnight years ago. Ford funded that. But during the time I was there, it was like I had to pull it up again and say, as I was working, trying to convince my colleagues around the country, this is what we need to be doing in communities. We don't need to be funding all these big intermediaries who've never been in these places. And they're telling us what the people who live there need. So, so EPIP really offered to, to, to me and to my colleagues evidence that there were new and younger people coming along that should and would take our spaces and would probably do the work of foundations much better um and then of course you influenced you know other um groups in philanthropy who were young adults um so the cin you know you were not a part they were not a part of you um the black giving circles were not a part of um of epip and there was kind of some friction about that because again Rusty was trying to figure out the right timing and could he do it and whatever. But that group has grown and established itself in such a fine way. And then of course, APFI found money for the APFI fellows, right? I mean, just, it's not that you were in there all the time that you personally were in there, but it was the idea that somebody was saying, we better pay attention to these young people and nurture them. Mm -hmm. So that they are really prepared for the future, and the future was going to be in a couple of years. Mm -hmm. So that that's how it affected my my professional life. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I always say for me, uh, a pip was um, it's such a a place of uh, belonging and connection and network early on in your career and. I am privileged in that way because I know it takes, for most people, it takes time to build your network and connections. And I was a new grant maker. I've been on the job maybe six months and fresh out of grad school and met Rusty and some other colleagues in the state um, in North Carolina. And at the time there was, there were probably about 15 people of color in the whole state in philanthropy and um and north carolina philanthropically at that time was at a place where it operational it operationalized like statewide so we did statewide gatherings and it was a whole state because that's just kind of how things worked at that time and um i think you know epip i so i was connected in the state and we worked together and collaboratively and wanted to do great work. But EPIP offered always this sense of connection and belonging that it was more, it was not just about me, not just about our state, but there was this kind of global, you know, um, others who do it. And so I was always learning about other types of foundations, other types of leaders, other types of experiences. Um, and pretty, blessed and fortunate in a way because the foundation I was at also had a young new ED 
he is 35, running this community foundation, just so happened to be probably one of the more progressive foundations in the state. Um, and he was kind of like, do your thing, whatever you need to do for EPIP, go ahead and do it. It was kind of like my professional development. So I could travel, I could go to the things and bring back what I learned and test out some things. So I think that learning piece and always like, I always had a backdrop that like, you know, the work that we were doing in our local community was the work we're doing in the local community. Um, but there was all sorts of other beautiful work going on across the country. And so, um, and I think as a young professional, new professional in this field, in that field, in the field, that was, um, it just impacted my worldview of how I, how I always navigated the field of philanthropy. And we all know it's very difficult to learn how to navigate anyway. Um, hence philanthropology and social justice and all the things, like it's difficult enough. And I think um, EPIP really gave me that early on and it's forever shaped kind of my view of the field. You know, I've always had a more field wide view of things and um, even if I was a part of fantastic work, I always knew that, you know, there's not fantastic work everywhere and there's still more work to do. So I think it gave me that sense. And so um, more balance, more centered and groundedness in the work. Anyone have, I think we have a question here, Let's pause. Um, so let's see. Um, Malavika, did you want to voice your question? Sure. Um, it's been incredibly helpful um, to hear about all of your experiences with EPIP as a supportive network. And so I guess as we're talking about the subject of paving the way for women of color leaders in philanthropy, um, for emerging practitioners, one thing I do wonder is as folks move from position to position, sometimes from foundation to foundation, um, that there is potentially a risk, I think, um, particularly for women of color, of losing some um, power or leadership stature in those transfers of roles. And so I guess I was just curious from you all if you've experienced any of this and also if EPIP provides any pathways for support um, during uh, those sorts of transitions of power, both within foundations and I think between roles. Mm. Great question, thank you. Um, I'll offer two things that came to mind when you asked the question. One is, gosh, I can't remember, you know, the folks who I grew up with in EPIP, you know, we've known each other now for like 15, 16 years and we held each other's hand, you know, it was, it may not have been part of the work in the beginning, official work of the organization, but um, whenever we were having challenges or wanted to transition or considering a different role or thinking about where we wanted our careers to go, what paths we wanted to take, we used each other. I mean, we talked through, we, we asked. Um, and I think, you know, this notion of like, you know, this is such a coveted field and it's really difficult to get into that we're often told, you know, wow, we got to stick to your role because, you know, it's, there's not many jobs in the field and all those things. And I think we probably were just so young and so, the way that we came up, we were just so encouraged by folks like Lavetta and everybody, like, keep doing what you're doing, keep, like, we just didn't think about that. We didn't have in front of our minds that whatever, we just felt like whatever change we wanted to make, it was about the, the impact of the work for us. It was grounded in those values and the community impact we wanted to make. Um, and for many of us, you know, our goal and vision wasn't to necessarily be the head of a foundation necessarily. It was to do great work. It was to, that was grounded in social justice, that really was rooted in racial equity, even though we weren't talking about it in that way. Um, 
And so I think we're a little bit like, you know, we just didn't allow that to kind of hold us back. Um, but I realized that that is a real thing and things have changed. So that's just my two cents. I'll add to that. Um, so in terms of the loss of power, I guess, as you move from position to position, um, I would say I've, I'm for, I have been fortunate in not having that experience. But part of the reason is because of the community that I built within EPIP. So I would say, you know, I came to EPIP after actually being gone from the sector for a couple of years because, you know, I got let go from the position. Um, and it had been so hard for me to figure out my way in philanthropy when it was just me by myself. The moment I got connected to a local chapter, the moment I started to attend events, the moment I started to just meet people and talk about some of the shared struggles we had within our institutions, when it was time for me to look for something new, I had folks that were flooding my inboxes with ideas. You know, one of my past jobs I got actually because a fellow steering committee member saw a position, said, oh my gosh, you would be great for this sent it to me, told her boss about it. And her boss was like, why aren't you applying for this job? And I think that is the power of, of network. And really, um, I like how you phrase it, Melissa, growing up with people in the sector. Um, I cannot underscore the true value of being connected to like-minded individuals who see you for what you bring to this work and are willing to speak your name in rooms where you are not present. That is how a network operates. That is what EP has provided. Um, and it's kind of informal. It just kind of happens. But I think there is this beautiful generosity that exists within the community and this spirit of abundance that doesn't exist elsewhere within the sector, right? We believe in something better. And so we believe in each other and are willing to support, advocate, agitate even each other on behalf of one another for when it's time for us to navigate within the sector. But I also hear within that question a request, and I'm, I'm actually glad that it came up because in thinking about the future of EPIP, you know, I'm six months in as, a, as the new ED, um, even though I've been in the community for some time, one of the things that uh, a couple of members have mentioned is this idea of space for women of color specifically. Like can EPIP hold space for a community of practice of women of color who are just seeking to form bonds with one another now to grow in philanthropy together. And in true EPIP fashion, the answer to that question is yes, and we're going to do that. And so while there isn't anything formalized in place right now, I will say that in the next couple of months and years, you will start to see more of that specific space, those specific spaces created for women of color in philanthropy or seeking to navigate the sector for even those who might identify as white and are trying to grapple with their whiteness as they navigate the sector and then continuing support for PDF, which became the People of Color Network or PCN, as we continue to believe in and support folks who are coming to the sector to change the sector. Why? Because I don't think that we can change the sector unless we support the people that make it work. And so um, I, the last thing I will just say is the value of being connected within the EPIP community is what has kept, it's part of what's kept me in the sector. It's part of what's kept me sane. And I think as I look at our panelists, for a lot of us, I would say it, it's pretty much that same thing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the notion of power, I'll say is, you know, um, expand, we should all expand like how we think of power. It's not just, you know, the head of the foundation, the bigger role, the VP, the whatever, like I learned uh, with EPIP the importance of like just, you know, um, shared power abundance network, like the power of my network. We were all in the same positions, but hey, my colleague who was on the board with me or in my chapter, you know, worked at this foundation and could navigate in their foundation. So we leveraged all of that. So I think there's the power that you might possess in your institution, but also there's that relational power through your EPIP network that can bring other organizations to bear to really see things. So I think, um, you know, that's, that's really important. Thank you for your question. Um, 
All right. Well, I'm going to move on to another question I have for the um, for the panelists, which is, as a woman of color, um, how has your leadership um, changed or been challenged by working in the field of philanthropy? Um, I can start, and I, and I do apologize. I will have to depart in about 10 minutes to join another call. But um, I would say that it has, um, as I mentioned before, how it has changed has certainly been I've been able to grow in, in comfort in being a leader. And one thing that EPIP taught me was that, just as you were saying, Melissa, you don't have to be the head of something, a department, or organization, or whatever, to be a leader. I would often tell people that I mentored that you can lead from where you sit. Um, and so, you know, finding your own leadership style and, you know, how, where you're comfortable in being a leader, whether it's just managing a strategy or running a subcommittee or just you know, being an officer or an, or an associate, you can still figure out ways to lead within your organization. Uh, and I think EPIC will help me realize that, number one, and then help me to, to cultivate and grow it. Um, I think in the challenge space, um, you know, I, I'll be frank and honest, I had, I, I had instances where um, opportunities that I know I was right for was given to a non-person of color. Um, and it was unfortunate that, that that was happening. And I knew that I could do this work. I knew that I could run the strategy. I knew that I could do X. And I put my voice out there and say, I want to do it. Put me in coach. And it would not be heard or it would be ignored and it would be given to a colleague who was a white, in most cases, a white woman. Um, and it, you know, it hurt a lot, but I had my squad and I had folks who would come to bat for me and, you know, and jump in and be like, you're awesome and you're fantastic and there'll be another opportunity and there's, there'll be another space for you to jump into and, and demonstrate your skills and your leadership. And um, I'm sure it happens in other sectors, but, you know, since I was sitting pretty solidly in philanthropy, that was certainly where I was challenged a few times. Thank you for sharing, Jasmine. Anyone else want to share? I don't, I'm hoping I'm going to say this right, but um, I think that the field of philanthropy, because it sits on this uh, love of mankind uh, platform, it encourages us to look inside first. Do I love myself? And to be reassured of who we are individually. Now, when I got to the Ford Foundation, there was no indication that I should have been there. I mean, I turned down, it was eight months of recruitment that I went through because I didn't believe they were looking for me. When I got there, there were people who had written two books, published books on their topic, on their field. I had none of that. But I kept being very clear with God, why am I here? And eventually it became very clear there was access that I had to communities and to women and people of color writ large that others in those positions didn't necessarily have or didn't want to admit that they had. Mm -hmm. And so I would say to you, Whatever you do in your EPIP organization, and it is your organization, find people who are similar to you and dissimilar, but be very clear that you are who you are. And get on a mad hunt to figure out what your strengths are and where you need um, enhancement. And, and just find people who have ways of being able to support you in your enhancement, whether it's giving you uh, good reading materials, whether it's encouraging you to take a step that you wouldn't normally take, but just go for it. Because while the field of philanthropy, I often say it, it's very generous, it's not very nice. I'm saying to you, you can make it become what you need it to be so that you can do what you believe you're called to do. But a lot of that is introspective, mm -hmm. as well as, you know, reaching forward and connecting with people around you.
Beautifully said, Lenana. Resonates a lot. Anyone else want to share any talk about how your leadership has changed or challenges has been challenged? I'll share. Um, how has my leadership changed? Um, I think to Lynetta's point, like knowing who you are and finding people who are similarly aligned very much resonates with me. Um, I, I think I'm at this very interesting point in my leadership journey where I'm kind of relaxing into the stormness <laughs> that I bring into, into the work and <laughs> realizing like, there's nothing about that that needs to necessarily go away. If anything, maybe some tweaking, maybe a little refinement, and maybe in some places, maybe you're not loud or bold, or maybe you're not like you enough in some of those spaces. And I think that has been the more interesting part of my own leadership journey. I had, I remember this moment, probably, yeah, maybe five, six years ago, uh, where I'd met someone um, and told him where I worked. And he was very, you know, very important. I was like, you know, everyone wanted him to be speaking on all of the panels. And he turned to me and he said, you don't look like you work in philanthropy. And I looked back at him and I said, thank you. That is a compliment. That is a high compliment. Um, because what does looking like working in philanthropy look like? I don't know. But I know that I'm not that, and that's okay. And I think it's important to have that kind of acceptance, um, especially in this sector where, you know, oftentimes we are being asked to conform to aspects of white dominant culture in the workplace that don't actually suit us. We're asked mm -hmm. to adopt a certain level of professionalism that actually is not natural for how, I would say for myself, how I as a black queer woman from, the hood, like that's not how I show up. That's not how I want to show up. Um, and I think that as I've realized that that is okay and actually that, that difference is necessary and that difference means that there is a way being made for other folks who are coming up in this work right now who need to see an example of someone who is leading the way that I lead or leading the way that you, Melissa, lead or Michelle or Jasmine or Lynette. There are people that need to see those examples of the diversity of leadership of women of color because we don't all lead the same. It's not all, it doesn't all feel the same. And so recognizing that there is space for difference and it is welcome is what has, um, I guess, transformed how I show up and has actually relieved some of the imposter syndrome and the anxiety that we, especially women of color, carry when we sit in these seats of traditional power and authority. Like, I think we are all powerful, full stop, titles aside. It's what we do with that power that matters. And one, but, but before we do something with it, we have to own it. And so I would say this year for all, all of the reasons is forcing me to own it in a different way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Beautifully said, yeah. Love that, beautifully said. I think, you know, one of the things that uh, just happened to coincide, you know, with how I met Rusty and EPIP and philanthropology and being new to philanthropy is, you know, we, you know, the reason why we have philanthropy is based on, you know, just historical severe economic injustice. And so when we all enter, we're forced to reconcile with our own space on the continuum. Where do we see ourselves fitting in that? We're in a, we're in a privileged place where we give away money, not our money, give, give away people's money to organizations to try to make the best impact, help the most people uh, in theory. And we all have our own story around money and wealth and all those things. And so I think there was a point in which I imagine in all of our journeys that you're forced to kind of just reconcile how you feel about all those things. Um, and some of those things comes out through testing 
of your own self or leadership or choices in your job in this particular field. And so when you're, you know, I just remember I was, I was the only program officer at this foundation, the only black person on staff. And so my job was to recommend grants. And, um, and so I would recommend the slates and, you know, the grants committee would decide who gets funded. And I had to choose who am I going to really go hard and advocate for? You know, how many like layers of thinking you go through in doing that? Well, gosh, I really want to highlight these groups, but there are two of the black groups. Are they going to think because I'm black? Okay. You know what I'm saying? It's just all levels of how you reconcile and wrestle with how, how to do the best good, how to do the most good. And then where you knowingly have to, you know, put yourself on the line to advocate. There's always going to be those moments. And so I think that the challenge in the leadership is just, I really appreciate Lynetta raising, like it starts with you because at the end of the day, um, you know, you want to feel good about your work. And I've seen so many transitions happen because there's something that, that you don't feel good about the work and how it's being carried out or handled, how it makes you feel. And so I think um, it's both a very, you know, personal and communal responsibility that you carry. And so it's one of the unique fields in which all these things kind of come at play. So anyway, just to say, you know, it's not an easy job. You know, a lot of people, and all of my colleagues are, oh my gosh, what? You give away money, you know, that's so great. It's so easy. Oh my gosh. And, you know, for folks who don't know the field, but it's much more complicated. It's much more, you know, to whom, you know, you're giving a lot to sit in the place of privilege, but that means you um, sometimes that pressure in um, being compelled to do the most um, that you can is very real. And so, anyway, just wanted to say that, that, um, the reconcile and the paradoxes and paradigms, you know, are constant. And particularly as a person of color, um, you know, it is where you have to utilize your networks um, because sometimes there's just unique circumstances and opportunities that make you question things. Um, and what you don't want to ever question is yourself. Um, so. I think you have to know if you're making grants or you're in philanthropy in the United States, you have to really know America. I mean, you really, you really have to know America. All of the cultures that are there, the, uh, the behaviors, the, the, um, what everybody's now saying uh, has been uncovered by the pandemic, which is the very big role that the economy plays in all the decisions that are made in this country. If you do grant making in another nation, you've got to do the same thing because really what you're trying to do is to find a different way to tackle an old problem and attract some other people to join you in it. Um, your network inside of EPIP can give you so much information about that, just one-on-one, -on -one, mm -hmm. because we all think differently. Many of us come from different cultures, you know, um, have had different experiences. And believe you me, if you're working in a foundation now, they hired you because you were different. There was something different about you. America doesn't deal well with difference, but they're intrigued by it. So if you're African, not African-American, you might get a job that I wouldn't get. Why? Because you sound, oh, you're so exotic. There must be something, you know, I can learn. So understand people are always juxtaposing your, your uh, knowledge and wisdom with your difference. And once you're there inside the institution, you get to play that game too. Only you do it better because you're, your values and your commitment to getting things done differently should top all of that inquisitivity about difference. And I, I just have to keep putting that out there. I mean, it different from your field of interest, if you're an art and culture person, some people say, oh, well, you couldn't possibly work with us on economic development because you don't. We are just built that way in America. We, we came into the, to this spot in this nation, not accepting the people who were here. Who'd be why? They were different. And they had something we wanted. So philanthropy comes from those kinds of roots in America. 
And I just want to encourage you to really, you know, study your field, study the field that you've entered into, and then figure out what, how do I use the tools that I have to make it uh, more, more democratic? Mm-hmm. That's a word we don't use often. <laughs> you know, just, just kind of think that through. Mm-hmm. Do we have other questions? I have a question for the for you all. What's the strategy that you have for getting to generation is it Z? And getting, you know, changing the way they think about philanthropy, and, and or not even changing the way, hearing what they think about philanthropy, and think, thinking with them about what will it look like going forward. So, from an EPIP standpoint, talking about the organization. One of the things that I would love for us to do is to have a fellowship program where we actually target folks who are coming out of college uh, with a paid internship or fellowship where they can learn philanthropy while also working at EPIP and having exposure to our community. Um, I think that the fact that philanthropy is so mystical, you don't really know about it until you happen to be in it, is a loss. You know, it wasn't until my first job out of um, out of college, I was at a foundation, and I was like, "Oh, these you all give money to the organizations that I care about that serve communities that I like the communities that I come from." And once I realized the power there, that's when I made the decision to make philanthropy my field of choice. But imagine how much different that would have gone if I had known about philanthropy when I was in high school. If I'd known about philanthropy as a sector when I was in college, if that was something that I had exposure to and realized that there was an opportunity for me there to make a career path out of that. And so one of the things that we will be um, fundraising for is the support of a fellowship program to create a pipeline of leaders. Like we talk about the EPIP leadership pipeline and oftentimes that's really about the folks who are already in the sector, the folks who are already in the seats but what about the folks who aren't? Mm-hmm. And so trying to you know, reach back while we also push forward at the same time. So that's something that is to come from the organization over the next couple of years. Great. Great. We do have a question that was raised in the chat. Um, Diana, did you wanna voice your question? Yes, I'm here. Um, I guess my question was related to uh, the conversation earlier um, in regards to kind of reconciling um, your work managing portfolios and wealth that is obviously, if it's a family foundation, it's from wealth that they've you know, sort of produced, but generally it's you know, like the justice funders model on the West Coast that it was all through sort of exploitive practices from those very same communities that produce that wealth. Um, and so I wanted to hear a little bit from the panelists about their kind of reconciling that when you are advocating for particular organizations in, you know, as a woman of color and kind of, you know, positioned by the staff and the organization, not necessarily to be, uh, to be representative. I, I just didn't want to use the word token, but to be rep- sort of a representative in some way especially around social justice issues and issues around poverty. That's a great question. Uh, I'll jump in um, to this (laughs) very poignant question. it's a Sorry, I, I, I tend to ask very uh, pointed, direct questions. <laughs> <As> <laughs> no, it's good. Like, it's great. <laughs> it, it, it's good. You no, know, it's good. And it's real. And it's a thing. And I think every day I have a different internal strategy <laughs> about how I reconcile that. But <sighs> I, guess, I guess what I want to share is that I know that throughout my um, philanthropic career, and I've also I've also done a lot of grant making as a volunteer, right? So I've participated in, on a lot of grant making committees, um, 
as a as a committee member, as a commit as a grant reviewer, um, and so I've, I've I've kind of like snuck into those places as well. So, um, <clears throat> and what I feel I've been able to do is to influence decision making towards organizations that are power building and organizing. Um, and I wasn't alone in that exercise. I had al allies in that exercise. I have allies in that exercise. Um, but I know that my voice and lens was making a difference in that conversation with that, with that, around that decision on that grant. And, and bringing it back to EPIP, I, I, I want to sort of say the word evoke, right? The definition of evoke is to bring into the conscious mind. Um, so what I do in those spaces is I recall this conversation, right? I recall Lynetta's words. I recall Storm's vision. And I um, evoke the learning and the power of EPIP to be so that I can be spe discerning, specific, and unequivocal in my advocacy when I'm, when I'm in that space. But you're asking, a, I think, a broader question, right, which is really about the relationship of philanthropy to capitalism. Um, and I can't answer that question, but it's real. It, it's real. And um, yeah, hopefully that, that I, I hope that that provided some 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 response. It, it does. Thank you. Yeah, I, I I was curious about that because I think I was thinking back on uh, what Storm was saying earlier of, you know, uh, um, experiences uh, as a woman of color in organizations and workplaces that are lacking diversity, that are, you know, uh, you know, patriarchal. They're you're, they're built for white supremacy. Like to me, that's how many nonprofit organizations are and many foundations are, unfortunately. And so I was curious about that because obviously as women of color, you uh, are oftentimes faced with that challenge of being a strong, vibrant advocate and not coming up against that lens of being a fiery Latina, about being an angry black woman, about me, you know, and so that to me is kind of, um, pushing forward incredibly valued work for our communities, I, I, it would seem really troubling and disheartening at times. Um, it seems like right now, I think all of us are definitely saying that things are moving in a, in a very fast and uh, at times optimistic, hopefully. Um, but I was just curious about kind of your, your personal thoughts on, on that position that you have to take sometimes. Well, I, I will say two things. I think um, one, my, my ability to identify what, what role and purpose and impact I want to seek in whatever work situation I am has evolved over time. It's gotten sharper, right, with each experience. Um, and, and directly to your point, I think... Um, Knowing yourself, knowing this field, and knowing the where a platform you have, and what its you know what's its highest utility is important, right? So, um, if you work in a foundation, they give away this amount of money. Here's their areas of grant making. Here's how much money you have to give away. Here's their history of what they've given money to. And then here is your view of how you see the community and your purpose and role. And so I think learning all of the, really educating yourself about all those things allows you to, one, I think, make a choice. You have to determine where is my power in this organization? What role am I in? How, what is the highest possible impact I can have given the current tools, you know, especially as a new, if you're new to a role or, and you, 
you test and you push and you figure out where there is room and capacity and um, softness to kind of push through to shift something. I think um, I would say two things. One, always consider whatever role you're in that, and I think for women of color, we automatically sort of take on that persona of like, I've got to push. I'm going to change or shift something by being in this place, by being in this role, by being in this seat. And figuring out, you got to test a bunch of different things to figure out where is your push going to be. One, it's about your skills and your tendencies and your your care and love and where that comes from, but also, um, you know, where are the other power levers that are around you and where can you push? And then figuring out how you need to shore up support internally and externally and calculate and navigate your move in terms of shift. I mean, I think the idea is the reconciling does not stop. You know, you always have to navigate it. It's always going to be there um, because, you know, we're living in a, you know, patriarchal, you know, society that's steeped in structural racism and these systems and things, they're all structures that get in the way of the work that we actually really want to do. Um, but really seeing your role and where you are as a place of shift, like changing something, something has to be different, you know, than where you left, you know, than how, how, you, how you came into it. And I think figuring out and having that, that thought and then figuring out what is that difference? What kind of difference do you want to make? Is there a difference that you can make in your current seat or role? Um, and if not, what kind of agitation can you cause to at least plant a seed of ideas or what, you know, you don't have to like change the world, but like just by being your authentic self, you're going to dispel a bunch of myths and thoughts, you know, about what people look like in this role or whatever, you're already going to make a shift, but leave this notion of like leaving, you know, leaving behind something, um, that shifts the atmosphere just ever so little um, to kind of break down, you know, you know, centuries long of, you know, just barriers and obstacles and trust. I just think it's important. So I think, you know, we can't get too daunted by all the things, but we can be really clear and targeted and focused about who we are and what we can do and work hard at doing that. Do a great job at your work and also work hard at shifting things ever so much. You know, I think the question you've asked is that depending on where you are, what kinds of, of philanthropic institution you're, you're working in uh, to some extent, uh, whether you're at the local level, at a community foundation, at a family foundation, if you're regional or if you're national or global, but here's what I would say holds fast in each case. Relationships are key to philanthropy. They just absolutely are. And so one of the things that guided me when I first got into philanthropy at a community foundation was that I happen to have known very, very wealthy, high-end, what we call silk stocking families in New Orleans, and I knew people in the hood saw them all the time was you know friends and all of that and I knew both of them in terms of how they yearned for something different some had what money but no good ideas I can't say no good ideas but limited good ideas some people had great ideas and no resources and my literal prayer when I made a decision to stay in New Orleans was that God would show me how to bring the bridge be a bridge between those those disparate folks so my grant making became a series of building relationships with donors, with people who hadn't even given to the community foundation, with people who had good ideas and no organization, trying to help them be, figure out they had, the nonprofit um, strategy was one of them. So, but all throughout that work, probably in my seventh year at the community foundation, I realized 
the work was to build a new generation of community-based nonprofits that were considered legit and who could be the thorn in the side of some of those bigger institutions that wouldn't make the changes around race and equity that they needed to make. Same thing working you know, at the national level. I didn't know everything about all the tools of the Ford Foundation or all the wisdom inside of it, but I knew the people, some of the people inside and I spent time getting to know them even better. And so when I was trying to figure out what, how I wanted to posit the resources that I had as a program officer, I could talk to others about what they were doing and try to get a, big, a bigger and better understanding of how the resources I would have to play with could make a difference. But in each case, I wasn't just a passive learner about that person. I was sharing something of myself. And in philanthropy, I keep saying it's important to know yourself because I had to move from where I was to New York City. You know, and I had to be in an institution, a place where I didn't know anybody really, but I knew that there was something I was supposed to do. So I didn't change my traditions. You know, I like sitting with just anybody for lunch and getting to meet, meet them. I did that. Well, at Ford, the tradition wasn't that. You went to the lunchroom and you had an appointment. You met with somebody and you talked with that person. Then you got up and you went back. But I just sat with everybody from the vice president, because the president, I don't know where she, in her office or someplace else, but whatever. If I knew you, I, I spent time with you. So that when I had to make presentations about nonprofits that I felt we're good, but we shouldn't keep funding them because here's all that they missed. People understood me and knew that I had done the work, the reconnaissance, to validate why I was making that recommendation. But they also knew that in some cases I was malleable. And they could sit down and talk with me about something and say, you know, I don't know if that's such a good idea. You may want to structure it this way. But I, one thing I knew was that just about everybody at that Ford Foundation was focused on social justice outcomes. So I played to that. I really had to think about what is it that I'm going to commit myself to that not, not only has a social justice banner, but lifts up Black people and other people of color. So it, it's, a, it's a relational thing, so much so that, you know, I was given the Board of Philanthropy work to do with Ford. And when I went back, four years later and announced what had, what we built and what the community foundations were doing and this and that. And someone, a vice president laughed. And then another person laughed. And I said, why are you laughing? And they said, well, we never thought you, well, we didn't know, we didn't think you could do it. Why? And it hurt at first, but then I thought, but then you didn't believe in the mission that you set out. So I'm just saying to you, your, your, your question is real and it's complex, but it starts with relationships. They're not always going to be good relationships, but at least you're learning how others think and you're, and you're making yourself available for people to learn from you. This, this whole mantra about racial equity and inclusion is a joke unless people are willing to accept you as you come in the door you're different and you may bring something that's going to help us push this boulder up the hill or down the hill or wherever we're trying to get it. So remember, you're, this is a, you're going to need people and you're going to need to know how they think all the time if you're going to stay effective. And all that stuff that uh, Melissa just said is very, very true. But in each foundation or each philanthropic institution, and not, not institution, situation, because now remember, we've been talking about organized philanthropy mostly, but look at all the money that has been made that's not in the traditional foundation structure, endowed foundation structures that we know. Think about it. Pick five very wealthy people who made money in the last three years. They have as much money or more than Ford and, and Kellogg together. So two or three wealthy people now can get together and do something. We've got to figure out how you as a young and new person in the field, how do I influence their thinking so that that wealth really does begin to make social justice a reality? Those are the things that you get to learn in EPIP. And when they created a 
a curriculum and they have workshops. And those are the things you need to be talking about. Yeah. Thank you, Lynetta. Yeah. We do have two more questions, I see. Um, Ms. Manuela has a question and then um, Natalie, I see your hand is raised. So is Manuela, did you want to pose your question? Got a lot of uh, amens to your question there. You guys can repeat what I mean? Yes. Okay. Yeah, so I appreciate what you were saying um, about like planting the seed, but you know, the first thing that comes to mind and within some of the experiences of other um, women of color um, within the organization I work with, in philanthropy, like oftentimes, like within role and also within like those who are like in higher positions, they'll like usually like I'm a program associate, so that's like under like a senior associate and you present these ideas, they'll like push it off, they'll ignore you or like, you know, they will kind of like just like completely spin it and then all of a sudden, I don't know where, they will just take this planted seed of idea and elevate it as their own and articulate it as, as if their own, as if they thought about it, you know, for as long as who knows and they get all the credit for it, which is like, I don't mind about the credit, but it's just like, just, it's also acknowledging that like this thought was not your own. It was, you know, someone came up with this idea and that also, also, just like, I'm also tired of like, anti-racist is the most common thing, especially given this upright, given the movement, this global movement in 2020, like like no one within my job, you see, never used the word anti-racist. And all of a sudden another woman of color started, you know, saying, how can we be more anti-racist? And all the white people them are now using the word anti-racist in many of their work. And I'm like, do you even really understand what anti-racist means? And like, just things like that, just like taking things and kind of escalating as if they've been thinking about this and, you know, doing this type of work for like, as long as they've been um, in philanthropy. Mm -hmm. Yes, there's a lot of head nodding. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> so much to time say. do we have? <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm hoping that my fellow panelists will have a better <laughs> response than I do. But my experience is that unfortunately, philanthropy can be a very harmful space for people of color or for people who don't have access to a tra traditional roles of power. And I have had the same experiences where something that I've said in a meeting room only five minutes later, the person sitting next to me says the same thing and everyone in the room goes up for it as if, as if it was the most brilliant thing in the world. And I look to my colleagues who, you know, at the time were women of color, like, but didn't I just say that? Did I, did I not just say that? So I, I, I don't have an answer as to like how to prevent that from happening. I will tell you what has saved me is they may have the recipe, but they don't have the sauce. If you get what I'm saying. You may know the steps, a cup of this, a sprinkle of that, but you don't have that little mm, something that you only you bring to your work. And I think, um, i trying to remember who said this to me. I think it might've been Sharice West Gandleberry said at an EPIP board meeting where she was invited in as a guest speaker, actually said, you know, when you're thinking about your role in the work, remove your ego from it. And that was hard for me to hear because I'm like, but I should get credit for the things that I'm doing because I'm doing them. I should have credit for the, the intellectual labor that I am putting into this work because it came from me. But I think what she was really uh, challenging us in the room to think about is what is the most important thing in that moment? Is it being credited for the idea or is it making sure the idea itself happens? And, you know, that has helped me to, in some ways, you know, like, okay, take it, run with it, sure, um, and deal with some of those, those issues. And I'll also say that um, 
while folks may have the recipe, the sauce is that thing that makes you uniquely you. And there, they, you will find that in some of those moments, though someone may steal your idea, it doesn't fit right. It doesn't sit right. It doesn't move properly because you are the, the, the secret sauce that actually makes it happen. Um, that's what I would have to offer. Uh, I wish that the sector, not even just the sector, I think it's a byproduct of just uh, how we value ideas in this country and who we decide is valuable enough to have a good idea. Um, and so until we change that, it's going to continue to perpetuate even within our sector. But if nothing else, I think being really clear on who you are and what you bring and what you contribute and knowing your why, like why you do this work, I don't care if someone else takes, you know, it's, it's less about taking uh, credit for, for the thing and more or less about it getting done. And as you go forward throughout your career, folks will start to connect the dots and see like, oh, it's not just this initiative, it's actually, it was you that made it that special. It was you that made it that different, and it was you. And I think that's only something that, at least for me, I've experienced happening over time. Mm -hmm. I agree. I agree, yeah. Yeah, I don't think, yeah. It's just that I think, yeah. My, my first day on the job as a grant maker, um, the president sent me to a meeting at the chamber of the local town. Um, and I didn't know why I just went to the, you know, went to the meeting, literally my very first day. And I mean, I came back livid. <laughs> they were talking about the economy and businesses and all this. And I was also newish to the community, though I knew a little bit about the community, but I've never lived there. Um, which is important, you know, the community foundation to really get to know. I didn't know enough of the community, so I, so I felt hamstrung. So I didn't, I wasn't from there. I didn't know enough to say anything because, you know, I would have said something. But then what I was hearing was all sorts of, in my mind, like, why are they talking about this word that way? Are they saying, are they saying that because these are minority businesses and this package and all this? I mean, and plus it was predominantly white men there too. So I'm like, why? Why did, I was like, oh my gosh, they made a mistake. Why did they hire me? Why did he send me to this meeting? I came back just livid. One, because I felt hamstrung because I couldn't speak up. But two, because of the how they were talking about the community and the work and the business. I was like, is this what we're about? Did he send me here to learn from? Anyway, so I come back to the office, storm into the president's office. <laughs> First day on the job now. And I was like, I think you, I think we have to have a conversation. And he was like, what's going on? And so I tell him about like my reactions to the meeting and blah, blah, blah. And so he was like, you're absolutely right. He was like, I sent you to that meeting because we have a lot of donors in that meeting that give to us. Um, we're a partner with the chamber. This is our work. Being in a community foundation means we are community with everybody. And so why don't you write down all of your thoughts and he was like, I get you didn't say anything, but I imagine that your face was speaking. So he was like, you might have to work on that. And he was like, this is why I sent you here because this is the world that we navigate. We don't always have to agree with everything. I didn't send you there because I agree. And so I think, um, I think it taught, it taught me a lot of lessons, but also it, it helped me to think more about like, you know, ideas and assumptions like, well, why don't you say that? Why don't you go to the meeting and say that and do this? You know, I was asking him like, what would be the right course of action or, and he was like, well, you know, we're not here to take credit and not, we don't, we don't have to be the one to say it, but we can be the one to act differently. We need to know what everybody else is thinking and saying, um, but how we choose to act as a community foundation can be radically different. And so therein began my own kind of really lot of hard lessons around taking credit, not taking credit. Because from that day on, I didn't focus on credit or I didn't have to be the one to say it or whatever, but I focused on the work that I did, my actions speaking for itself. And I think, um, it took a few hard knocks, you know, to kind of reel that in, but 
this notion of leaving the ego out is was very real. Um, and so I just let I just let that go and just focus on the work. And I think your ideas, your vision, your work, people, even if you're not credited, people see who's actually doing the work. Um, and the more clear you are about who you are and how you do your work, people see that. Um, so, um, Natalie, do we want to get to your question? Yes, thank you. Um, yeah, so enjoying the conversation as well as the chat. Um, so I'm going to try to take the, the flipping table comment um, and include that in my question. So, um, and I guess my sense is, you know, we've talked about reform. We've talked about spaces of influence within the system. Um, we're looking at radically changing the system. Um, and, um, but at, at the same time, I wanted to know if, if in your experience, um, there have been folks who've really radically looked at um, just alternatives to what the system offers. I mean, we've already talked about how it's based within, or that the wealth is, is derived from our capitalism, extractive economies. Um, and so I was wondering if in your experience, you've seen folks um, uh, test out just uh, models of philanthropy based on more liberatory principles. And from that, I'm meaning um, money raised out of uh, building up community wealth and reinvesting through localized cooperative decision making um, into the commons or the common goods of the community in a more of a, a regenerative, regenerative economic um, fashion. Um, so I wanted to see if, if there was any experimentation around um, uh, where money comes from and how it is used and, and in a more circular um, community democratically based fashion. Um. I, I I'd love to jump in on on this question. I don't. I, I I mean, I think you're 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 um, sharing some ideas that are maybe a little outside of the experience I'm about to share. But um, as a volunteer, and I and I can't I can't sort of stress this enough. So much of what I've I've learned and been able to accomplish uh, within the realm of philanthropy has been through my civic leadership um, work. Uh, so, uh, as in that life, uh, a group of Latinas in San Diego established the Latina Giving Circle in San Diego. Um, and, and what I'm about to say, we don't we don't often say in public spaces because we want to really get away from this narrative. So we're trying to avoid repeating it. Um, but part, a big part of why we were motivated to do that was we were sick and tired of hearing that Latinos don't give. You know that that and simply because latinos aren't represented in 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 sort of the traditional frameworks of philanthropy but but culturally speaking we're an incredibly incredibly generous um and supportive and and, and community oriented um community and and so we established the Latina giving circle and what we did was we took that giving circle model and we turned it on its head you know, we looked at it and we said, no, that model actually doesn't doesn't serve us. And we eliminated minimums. We we um, so our 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 approach was give a gift that is important to you and your family. Like think about knowing that women so often are are, are caring for their family unit. So think about your family's economy and give and give a gift that's meaningful for that reality, that situation. Um, and we also started to track volunteer hours and hours provided in service of family and community um community ends um because we wanted to just redefine this and create a space where we could celebrate and uplift the generosity that's inherent in our culture in a way that makes sense for us and that computes for us um and so it's you know, we our youngest member is seven years old. She uh, gives out of her piggy bank every year five dollars, and and then we had like very sort of folks that had had you know really successful careers give very large gifts, and um, and what you know we're growing our financial base, but what but what we did even in our second grant round, which was you know just a couple of years ago. And was a modest amount. It was twenty thousand dollars. But we were we were the first grant maker in our region 
to um, grant to organizations that were responding to the family separation crisis when you know babies were taking being taken away from their moms. We were the first philanthropic institution to say we need to invest in this um, in our region in San Diego. Um, and we were able to use our influence just because we, we, we had our voice united around this and we were a philanthropic player and, and we made a stand on that. So I think I love the question because I feel really connected to that. There are other ways. There are other ways. And, 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 and ours sort of followed the path of a giving model, of a giving circle model. But, but yeah, yeah a wealth building. Um, yeah, let, there, I, I, I love the idea of let's challenge ourselves to get out of these mindsets. Um, because there are, there are other ways. I'll also really quickly lift up the work, um, and I'm glad I saw in the chat, of the Diversity Fund based in D.C. Um, I had the opportunity of serving as like one of their grant reviewers, and basically the Diversity Fund is a group of D.C. area residents, mostly people of color, mostly, I would say, activists or folks who have activist roots, um, and they basically fundraise funds that are then redistributed to social justice organizations specifically. And it's very beautiful because you have around the table during the grant review cycle people that don't come from traditional philanthropy, but people who come from social justice activist organizing work and are voting on grants to be distributed to organizations in the same community. So the, the kinds of conversations that we've had around the table have been very illuminating because you can vote, you have this uh, organization before you, but because someone's an organizer in the room and actually knows the real deal about, about that particular organization can speak to um, some of the work that they are doing and how it may cause harm or, or give some additional context to that request that then influences the way that the, the group around the table actually discusses and it sometimes debates who should get those funding, who should get that funding. Um, yes, the Community Investment Network is also a great example. I'll also lift up in terms of traditional philanthropy. I really appreciate the work that the New York Women's Foundation is doing. Um, they have done and have been doing this um, community-based grants model where they actually have community members that are on their grant review committee cycle, if I'm remembering this correctly, and they train them on how to basically review grants and what to evaluate, but it's very much in the hands of the people from the community. And I think uh, there are a number of women's foundations that are similarly trying to lean into that same line of work, having young women and girls, young women and girls of color sit on grants review committees help um, basically dictate where the funds go to. So there are some, some, um, and those are just the ones that I happen to know of off the top of my head because I've had the good fortune to either work alongside them or I've heard about the work. But I, I do think that there are some organizations, um, traditional foundations that are trying to look at a more radical way of grant making, realizing that the communities that are closest to the issues are also the communities that have the solutions and it is the responsibility of the foundation to basically just give them the money and allow them to make the decisions. Thank you. Um, well, folks, we are over time. I, my apologies. Um, um, I hope there, if there were questions that you didn't get to ask, you can share them with Storm and Tamitha. Um, I want to thank my panelists, Lynetta Storm, Michelle, and Jasmine. Um, thank Tamitha for her support and thank all of you for just being so open and engaging right off the bat. Um, your questions both uh, were, you know, both um, grounding for us who's been in the movement for a little bit and also inspiring that, um, you're thinking about such things at this time as, as sort of uh, in the field right now. So I'm gonna turn it over to the storm. It's been a privilege. Thank you, everybody. I just wanna say thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, this conversation really did something wonderful for my soul and my spirit. So thank you, Melissa, for pulling us all together. And thank you everyone for joining us today. Um, I hope that I'll see a number of you at our virtual happy hour, which kicks off at 5 p.m. Eastern time. 
and hopefully we'll be continuing to have some of these conversations over the next couple of weeks. Please check out the schedule on our website. Um, we have a lot of wonderful things in store. And again, you know, I, I'm just grateful for the EPIP community and grateful for the legacy that the women on this panel have, have brought and have left behind. And I think each of us has something additional to contribute to EPIP and its community. And I look forward to building that new future with you all together over the next couple of years. So with that, I'll say thank you and see you, see some of you in about an hour or so. <laughs> thank you, Storm. Bye. <laughs> Bye, everyone. Thank you. Love you, Storm.